Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution. 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 Do you want a revolution? You say you want a revolution. Revolution. The revolution. It's going on right now. Welcome to The Revolution, the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we ask today's most successful entrepreneurs to share the tools and strategies they use to build relationships and connections to grow their revenue. Now, now, your host for The Revolution, John Corcoran. All right, welcome everyone. John Corcoran here. I'm the host of this show. And, uh, for those of you who have not checked it out before, hopefully you have, but if you haven't, check out our archives because we've got some great interviews with smart CEOs, founders, and entrepreneurs of all kinds of companies ranging from Netflix to Kinko's, YPO, EO, Activation Blizzard, Landing Tree, and many more. And I'm also the co-founder of Rise25, where we help connect B2B business owners to their ideal prospects. My guest here today, his name is Jabez Lebret. He went from homeless as a teenager to then studying finance in college, had to drop out of high school, but then went back, got his GED, went and studied finance, and eventually made his way to Nordstrom's. He's had his own uh, agency, which he sold, marketing agency, which he sold. He's he's run a, a boarding school. He's been involved in a lot of different things and has spoken on on lots of different stages, given over a thousand different presentations, written books, um, very active in the entrepreneurs organization, EO, which I'm active in as well. And he now runs Lotus Launch, which is an online content library helping entrepreneurs manage their journey to seven figures and beyond in, in revenue. And his book is I Don't Match Socks. I love that title. Seven Principles That Open Doors Lead to Promotions and Build a Better uh, Culture. And fun fact, he grew up in a small or originally was born in a small remote village in Alaska. So we'll have to hear all about that. Of course, this episode brought to you by my company, Rise25, where we help B2B businesses to get clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships with done-for-you podcasts and content marketing. And you can learn all about what we do at rise25.com. Uh, all right, Jabez, I'm so excited to have you here. I saw you speak on stage uh, at a conference last year, uh, an EO conference in Los Angeles, and you just absolutely crushed it telling your your personal story and connecting it to the work that you do. Um, first, let's start with that story. So you had a, a bit of a tough upbringing, um, started in a remote village in Alaska. I'd love to know what that was like. Um, but you, you ended up uh, being homeless for a while as a teenager. Um, so take us back to that that period of your life and some of the lessons that uh, you bring forward from that experience. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on, Will. Um, it's it's an honor to be here. And, you know, we don't often never really choose the kind of the beginning that that's kind of one of those things that, you know, your life starts the way it starts. And, you know, I've, I've, I know some of your guests you've had on before, like Victor and, and some other folks who've had some interesting um, upbringings as well. And, and they'll probably say the same thing, which is, you just kind of are dealt a, a certain deck of cards and you just kind of, kind of go with it. Um, you know, my mom's a paranoid schizophrenic and, you know, she really struggled, you know, through that in her early twenties and she had moved up to Alaska to get away from everybody and then met my dad and I happened. Um, I was, interestingly, I was the last baby born in my town. So the doctor retired and now all the moms have to get, they closed the like main hospital down and now all the moms have to get flown over to another city. And that's kind of an Alaska thing. Like that's not that surprising in Alaska. <laughs> um, you know, but we lived in a cabin like out in the bush and they were both fishermen. They had a salmon fishing operation and I was about two weeks old. My mom had a, a pretty major episode and, um, you know, it involved a, a shooting and, you know, my dad, uh, survived um, the incident and my mom, you know, had to go in a mental hospital and it, it just really kind of set the tone for what the beginning of my kind of journey was going to look like. And, you know, as I progressed, so many people stepped in to help out, you know, and, and kind of give me support, but I, I still kind of meandered through, um, you know, and, and eventually when I was in high school, my mom had another episode and, you know, I ended up homeless, you know, my mom just disappeared. And, I'd and by this point, go. you are in Spokane, Washington. Yeah. So my parents had separated and um, I was playing parent tag uh, for those that, that had, you know, separate parents. And so I was bouncing back and forth between Alaska and Spokane. And um, my dad had lost custody a couple of years prior. And, you know, so he he was up there and I hadn't been up to Alaska for a couple of years. And then I was 16 and, you know, it was the weekend before Thanksgiving and, you know, my mom just left you know and and she had remarried 
stepdad was pretty abusive. So it wasn't a good environment. And, um, you know, I kind of was on my own from then on. But luckily, like in that situation, I had five friends, parents who let me couch surf through the remainder of my junior and senior year in high school. So you moved, you, know? you end up moving around from different friends' houses. Um, are you working at the same time trying to? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. started working at 14 um, mm. at, a, at a latte stand. I was a little, little young barista there. Probably <laughs> totally, total, probably total violation of, of OSHA or whatever. <laughs> but like I worked at this little coffee stand and uh, then I eventually I got a bit job bagging groceries. It's Washington State, they're known for their yeah, coffee. So they sure. so, look the know, other way. Like, they're those, like, hey, yeah. the coffee is the important part. Yeah. Uh, forget the child labor laws. No, yeah. it's super awesome that, that I had people give me employment. Um, and, and that was really the only way that I got money was was through working. And so I didn't really have much of a choice there. And my parents' friends, you know, about one or two weeks per house, you know, and I kind of bounce around and, um, you know, I, I bagged groceries and worked in the deli and worked in the baker. I mean, I, I would work anywhere that would take me. I, I would work for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, were were there? Um, did you have entrepreneurial inclin inclinations at that point in time? Were you thinking entrepreneurial, or was it just like whatever I can do to make a buck? And you know, job was it for you? I God, you know, it's weird because I hate to think that entrepreneurialism, entrepreneurism is a, is like an inherent thing. But I, even as a, like a young kid, when I was like eight, nine years old, I was you know, there are a lot of some winters we get a lot of snow in Spokane. I'd like recruit my friends to come work for me and we'd go like shovel driveways and get snow off of roofs. In the summertime, I ran a little lawn mowing business. And, um, you know, I just kind of always kind of found myself in that situation in high school. Um, you know, I mean, I was I, I skipped class relentlessly. Like I like if you could get an A in cutting class, I was a acing that class that and one of my teachers, um, he was a, a physical science teacher who owned two small companies that he ran in the morning before high school. So he'd wake up at like four in the morning and like run these two small companies and then come be a teacher. And he said, hey, um, would you like to learn about entrepreneurship? And I was like, sure, like I, whatever that is. And, you know, he, and so he kind of walked me through it and we met from basically my sophomore, middle of my sophomore year through the end of high school, once a week on Wednesdays for about 20 minutes after class. And he just taught me about entrepreneurship for like a year and a half, mm -hmm. two, two and a half years, two and a half years, which is amazing. Like the, the, that teacher took that extra step, you know, yeah. that they didn't have to. But yeah, I mean, I came out. Must have seen something in you. Yeah, I don't know. I guess so. Um, you know, I mean, I think I I know since we ended up in a school project, I, I know so many teachers and they just really are like awesome. Like teachers are amazing humans. Um, but it was a it was pretty, pretty big deal for me that that he took the time and effort to do that um and, and really kind of give me a start in in understanding it. I mean, he even had me writing business plans. So like I wrote a business plan for a coffee stand um in my junior year in high school. I wasn't able to get it off the ground myself. And so we sold the plan to one of his friends in Florida and they're still up and operating 20 years later. Nice job selling like, the like, assets yes. though. I know, right? Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> I think I sold it for like $150. Like, still something. But I was stoked. Yeah, I was so excited. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your first business sale. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> um, and what about the the parents of the, uh, that, the kids that you were friends with that housed you, I mean, two years to house you, ro even rotating from house to house, that's a long time. Yeah, it is a long time. Um, you know, and, and I, I can't, I can't say enough to how just incredible it is. It, it, my life would have been a disaster had that not happened. I mean, I spent some time on the streets um, prior to that happening and, and that's not a place to be um, as, as a teenager. And so my, I owe, so much to these uh, families and individuals and the thought now like as an adult the thought of taking on a teenager like an extra teenager in your house sleeping on your couch like for two weeks that just blows my mind um but one of the families the dad owned an insurance company he was an insurance broker and so he had a uh an insurance company in town and he had maybe i don't know probably eight nine employees uh in in that office and had another office in seattle and uh, Dudley Bain, man, I, I learned a lot from watching that guy too. 
Man, I wish a, an insurance someone in insurance had taken me under their wing when I was in high school because to me it was it was always a, the joke career when I was younger. And then when you become an adult, you realize it's the absolute opposite. You sell something <laughs> once, you benefit from it for years to come. And everyone I know went into insurance. You know, 10, 15 years later, they're just like on the golf course. Yeah, yeah. I'm oversimplifying <laughs> it, but it seems it like that to me. That way, yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a great business to be in, um, for sure. Yeah. So you end up having to gra- you end up having to drop out of high school. Um, yeah, I just it, didn't have enough credits. It was yeah. a weird situation. I got kind of close to the end, and they I went to a huge high school, like two thousand students, and I and I never fault the the guidance counselor for not really having quite figured this out earlier. But like during my senior year, they're like, you don't you're not gonna have enough credits to graduate. So I like challenged a couple classes. I tried to audit out of a few classes, and I just couldn't quite get caught up. You know, but I was good at staying in the background. You know what I mean? Like I, I had learned to not, I didn't want any attention really in, in the sense of like, I just wanted to, to not have people know what was going on, um, and, you know, in, in my life in the back. Cause you know, it's embarrassing when you're a kid, yeah. especially. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Now um, I know for you, um, part of the inspiration behind the book that you wrote was uh, your appreciation for relationships. And, and you've mentioned it a couple of times these key relationships really helped you through you've taken that into the world of business. Um, was there, what was it from your, your high school years, your college years that helped you to, to learn some of these skills around relationship building that have helped you so much in business? So my mentor in high school, Art Dolan, um, for the first year, all we talked about when we talked about entrepreneurship was communication and understanding humans. So he'd have me read, articles on like body, you know, uh, um, how to read somebody's body language on different ways to interact and communicate Mas- Maslow's hierarchy down to, you know, understanding different personality types. And, and, and so he really, and I was like, when are we going to start talking about business? And he's like, you don't get it. Like this, <laughs> this is business. Business is understanding people and understanding how to communicate. And I was like, Oh, you're like a you're karate kid here. They got waxing oh, the car. You're like, I don't get it. hundred <laughs> percent. I'm like, why am I, I wanted to, I want to do business. Why are we not doing business? He's like, young son, you, you will misunderstand. <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah uh, that kind of set me on a trajectory of thinking about communication and understanding people in, in a, a nuanced way, but I was too young and I didn't really know what I was doing. And so it's like, you know, when a young kid learns a new skill, they kind of just flop around with it. Um, you know, but I kept kind of pushing at it and I got a job after high school and I kind of like got worked my way up the job a little bit. And then I got recruited by another company and then I worked up there and then I got recruited by AT&T and I started working there. And then uh, I met a guy named Patrick and he was uh, getting his his master's at Gonzaga University in Spokane. And Patrick pulled me aside one day and said, Jabez, like, when are you going to go to college? And I was like, Patrick, college, college isn't for me. Like, come on. Like, I didn't even graduate from high school. Like, this is ridiculous. Uh, And he's like, no, I really think you should go. When I reflect back on on kind of that moment, we were just coworkers, right? Um, the relationships that you build throughout the journey, it's not always about the relationships that you're going to have forever. And it's not always about the relationship being the biggest relationship or the most key monumental like person that you're like, man, if I could only get to know this person, everything will fall into place. That rarely happens, by the way. Um, but But sometimes it's just those little relationships that can have a pretty big impact on just your overall trajectory and, and opportunity. Um, and so I kind of took what he said to heart and I was like, well, maybe I should try. And so, you know, I tried to get into Gonzaga and they said no at first. And then I went back and convinced them to let me in and got my GED and, you know, eventually went back and started college. Um, you know, and, and, and I think that that's interesting that such a quick pivotal, and then I didn't work at at t anymore. And then Patrick graduated and went on to his life. And I've never talked to him since like, yeah, I haven't talked to him in 20 plus years. Um, you know, but he had a, a huge impact. And then after college, obviously, you know, I kind of started to hone in and learn the skills. And I had a mentor in Seattle that was really monumental in helping me understand how to build a network and then take it that kind of next level. Yeah. Yeah. You have, um, so many, such a variety of background and experiences. So one of the stops along the way, you were doing a lot of legal marketing, working with law firms. And I'm kind of fascinated by people that are able to infiltrate uh, worlds where, you know, um, there's a high degree of trust 
and where they're clearly an outsider. So I'm a recovering lawyer, so I can say this, but lawyers tend to like want to hire other lawyers to do their marketing. It's, it's the you. stupidest thing ever, <laughs> but you know it's true, right? They want to hire other lawyers to do their marketing. So how did you end up building a marketing firm focused on law firms? You know, given we've we've talked about your academic background isn't exactly going straight through Harvard Law. So they, it, it's funny. I, I remember very clearly I was at a, a an event, a, a law firm, a legal event, a bunch of lawyers, and somebody said, oh, you're a non-lawyer. And I was like, <laughs> non-lawyer? No, you're the lawyer. Like, I am not the non... It's like calling me a non-smoker. No, I'm not a non-smoker. You're the smoker. You are the lawyer. I am not a non-lawyer. I was like so offended. I seen if I had my book back there. Yeah. I was so offended. Um, and, and, and it's, it's like people, point, they, they like, draw that distinction, like in seconds, oh, like, oh, yeah. they sniff it out. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And I was like, OK, yes, fine. I'm a non-lawyer. Um, big problem in the legal industry if you're trying to break in, in into that industry as a non-lawyer um, to, to get any sort of trust at all. So the very first thing that I did um, that's, that began the journey of trust is I wrote a book. So my business partner, Mark Homer, and I. Um, we were at a conference and we were just kind of trying to figure out like, God, we got to find a better way to like connect with these lawyers and to get them to trust us. So we wrote like a 250 page book on how to market your law firm. And it was awesome. I mean, it was a really, really good, we, we gave away all of the secrets. Like we didn't keep anything back. And we just said, here's everything that you need to do from start to finish to do it right. Knowing that a lawyer is not going to want to spend their own time, which is billable hours, writing a blog post necessarily or tweaking their SEO or trying to figure out the best next design thing for this. Like they're just not going to want to do that. So they'll enough of them would hire us. Um, that was our first step. And it worked really well. Started getting us speaking engagements and getting us kind of in front of, of lawyers. And then I figured out that lawyers have their continuing legal education credits that are mandatory. And there's um, two areas that non-lawyers can create CLE courses. One of them is in ethics and one of them is in technology. And so I created a technology CLE and then I created a bunch of ethics of marketing CLEs, the ethics of marketing. And then next thing I knew, fast forward several years later, you know, I'm, I was considered a leading expert in legal ethics in 36 states, you know, in the U.S. and had dozens and dozens of CLEs under that I had created under my belt that, you know, we're helping kind of guide and lead law firms in states all over the country on the legal parameters of how to put their law firm online. Yeah. And that's such a great lesson because law degree or no law degree, then you'd establish your bona fides. You, you'd establish your, your credibility. You could point to all that and say, this, this is my credibility in this field. Yeah. I mean, they'd say like, oh, well, you're not a lawyer. And I'd say, well, yeah, but you just read my article in the American Bar Association. So, <laughs> so <laughs> right. apparently other lawyers trust exactly. me to know what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> right, right. So you end up um, selling that uh, agency and um, what inspired to go start a tuition free uh, boarding school for girls? Uh, uh, too much bourbon on vacation. Um, that's what you, actually kind of not. I thought joke. you were a drink, gin drinker. So, <laughs> that's what I read. But I am. I am. Way. I love gin. Um, that's the problem. Should have stuck to it. I, I should have stuck to it. So my, my wife and I were on vacation up in Northern California, and uh, we were just sitting around and literally we were having some bourbon, just enjoying ourselves. And my just like a flash in my brain, I had this idea, and I was like, "Holy crap! I think I can build a high school." that will pay for itself that we could use to leverage to help underserve youth or youth, youth like me, like kids that were like me. And my wife is, is brilliant. And, and she also understands really well that I am an idea machine and she's kind of more on the opposite of the fence. And so she was like, great idea. Uh, go think about it. And if in three to six months, you still are thinking about it, we can talk about it. Like, go do some research and see what you can figure out. So I went away and I did a bunch of research and I came back and I said, hey, I think we got a good idea here. Um, you should should help me figure this out. So she's like, okay. So she started doing some research as well. And next thing we knew, I was like, oh my gosh. It, once you know something, you can't unknow it, right? So like, once you've figured something out, you cannot unknow the knowledge you have. And we had a really, really innovative idea for a school um, that, that would have a really big impact on kids' lives. And 
you know, I, I think that when you start to get into that sort of territory, man, doing marketing for law firms it was awesome. And, and I'm so grateful for that business and, and for my business partner and all of our staff and, and everything. But how do you not go do that thing? Yeah. Like I feel was like this before this is before you sold it? Yeah, this was before I sold it. And so I had so to go kind to of my driving business partner. you. It was kind yeah. of driving you towards like, I want to do this next thing. Oh man. So I'd go to CLEs. I was traveling all over the country, right? Uh, going to deliver CLEs and to, you know, work with bar associations and meet with clients. And so while I was doing that traveling, you know, you get downtime when you're traveling for work. So I'd set appointments with education leaders in K-12. And so I started meeting for, for a couple of years. I got a chance to like meet with, you know, this person and this educator, because, you know, I'm not an educator, right? I don't come from K-12 in the sense that I've never been a teacher or administrator. So I had a lot of questions. And so I got to spend time just kind of asking questions and running my idea by people. And, and then, you know, my wife and I kind of tweaked the idea. And then we had something that we really had a solid plan and kept sharing it with more and more people. And a bunch of people said, that sounds awesome. Like that, that would a hundred percent work for the kids, but I don't think you could get it off the ground. Hmm. That was almost 90% of people's response. Of course, yeah, that probably, that existed, probably drove, me, drove oh, you a little bit. <laughs> worst thing you can tell me is, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'll oh, show that's you. A, that's an amazing idea and yeah. it'll never be able to happen. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. oh yeah, <laughs> it's like, yeah. just give me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, unfortunately, it didn't work out. Um, you it ran into not. trouble before well, the pandemic, but let's talk about it, what what happened. It, it did and it didn't. So we did launch. So we were able to launch, and we were in we were a school for two years, um, which is pretty amazing. And then we actually ended up opening the boarding program. We had students lived with us twenty four seven. You know, we picked all girls to start with because we needed to just focus and had to- all these plans for expansion. Um, you know, we had just found another school we were merging with. The next the next school year was going to be 65 students. Um, the very next school, we raised over a million dollars in about 18 months to, to launch the program. It was there, there was a relationship crash course right there in a new market. Um, and March rolls around 2020. And all of a sudden, like you're running a boarding school and mm. it's a brand new innovative boarding school. And, you know, the pandemic starts and the funding dries up because nobody's funding innovative programs that are just getting off the ground. And, yeah. you know, we, we can't keep the students for safety reasons. We, we Nobody knew when the pandemic started what the heck was going on. And, you know, so we had to send all the students home and get them set up at home so they could do online school. And they all came from really poor, you know, mm. households. And so we had to get them food and we had to get them internet. Like not all the household houses had internet. We had to like mm. get them laptops. And then we realized, oh, there's other siblings that don't have laptops. And so they're fighting over laptops. So we had to get everybody in the house a laptop. And like, mm. it became this ginormous lift to like mm. undo it was 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 almost as big, not really, but it felt like it was as big as getting it off the ground. Mm. Um, and then once we had all the students stable, we took a breath and we we're like, okay, what do we do? Like, what what what's next? Like, how do we how do we get? What, when would this get open again? Like, what what, what yeah. would that possibly look like? And we talked to our donors, and you know, our our biggest donors were pretty awesome, and they were like, you know, it's amazing what you did. And we're really glad that you did it, but we just don't think it's going to happen right now. Mm. And so we kind of um, went back to the drawing board and said, well, we can't wait. Like, I mean, we have like a two-year-old, like, yeah, we can't just, we can't just put our entire life on pause for a complete unknown that we have no control over. Um, And so we ended up, you know, kind of really winding it down from there. Yeah. Um, that must have been hard during the pandemic, winding it down, sending the kids home. It must have been oh. just incredible setback. Yeah. I mean, yes, hard for hard for us for sure. But the kid that you know you're sending home and mom's drunk at 10 a.m. every day, that that that's yeah. hard for them. Yeah. Much, much, much harder for them. Um and to have known that you had somewhere that they were safe and happy and growing, um, heartbreaking. Kind of, I don't, I don't know a, a way to really explain what that felt like to to have yeah. to do that. Um, you kind of have to remember 
you were trying your best and you can't control everything right. in life and it's going to happen. And about now, four months ago now, we got a call from a school. We had gotten one of our girls and uh, we'd gotten, you know, the, the child protective services involved, a really bad situation. Mm -hmm. We got her into another program that was actually a boarding school for foster youth um, in California. And so we were able to get her into the program mm -hmm. and we got a call from them four months ago that she needed to have her transcript updated because she's applying for college, mm. which is crazy. Like they mm. were dropouts when they got to us mm. and you just, you're just like, yeah, okay. That, 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 that is why that's why we did it. Yes. We were only one part of that, that human's journey, but God, like, thank God. Like we finally, yes, it, something happened. Great. And right. I know that there's more impact than we know. Um, and I think that's something that we often forget is that you don't always get the call that gives you the really big win that you right. see and feel, but that there's big wins that happen and you just never hear about them. And so that's why you kind of have to always be striving to make an impact and 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 connect with people because you just never know. Yeah. Um, now, like many entrepreneurs, um, your next venture was one that in many ways didn't have the same constraints as your previous venture. So Lotus Launch, let's talk about that. It's an online content library helping entrepreneurs manage their journey for, to a million dollars in revenue. Don't have to deal with a physical location of, <laughs> or any of those sorts of things. Don't have to deal uh, with the state, don't have to deal with nonprofit stuff. <laughs> right, right. So much easier. So talk about that. Yeah, we took our entrepreneurship was a foundation of our high school. So all of our education included an entrepreneurial angle because we believe entrepreneurship is the single most valuable skill set. Even if you don't become an entrepreneur, like even if you go to work at a company, being having that skill set of entrepreneurship is really valuable to, you know, especially now pivoting, right, pivoting yeah. and being able to be a problem solver and be resourceful and grit and determination, all that stuff. So we said we have all this curriculum that we had built for high school to teach entrepreneurship. And we're like, man, we still want to teach. We still want to make an impact. And I was like, why don't we take this? We've built companies and sold companies. Let's take this, retool it, make it more aligned with where you would be if you were actually in business and running it. And let's get this thing online. And let's just start helping entrepreneurs understand the nuts and bolts of the building of the business. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're not coaches. We're not there to like consult you. We're there to say, say, hey, um, do you need to understand cash flow management? Do you need to are you hiring your first employee? Are you firing your first employee? Are you just trying to make more sales and, and get your website to be better? Like wherever you're at, we're building courses for every single little thing that you might need to do. So you can go on and say, hey, I think we want to spin up a, a LinkedIn campaign. Mm -hmm. Go to the LinkedIn courses and they teach you all about LinkedIn and how to like use it to grow your business. Um, and it's really a way for us to kind of help continue to give back to the community and the entrepreneurship community, EO particularly, they're huge instrumental in, in our projects in, in getting CSU Academy off the ground. They were huge in winding down and not, you know, wanting to go jump out of a, a, a window. They were huge for the support to get that, getting computers and laptops for families. Like it was EO groups who stepped up. Mm fellow entrepreneurs who came in, you know, to, to help with that. And so any way that we can give back to that community in any capacity, I'm all in. Um, so through uh, Lotus Launch and through others that you talk to uh, in the world of entrepreneurship or coming up young kids, um, let's go back to relationship building. Uh, you've been through a lot in the last few years. These types of trying times tend to test our relationships and they tell us which are most important to us. What are the lessons that you share now for others out there, especially young kids coming up, about the importance of relationships now post pandemic? Yeah, man, I I, I had this mentor in Seattle, Thatch Nguyen, a uh, real estate broker, ridiculously successful. Um, Twenty years ago, when I was living in Seattle, he taught me this concept called contribution networking, which is the the concept of contributing to the other person with no intent of getting anything out of the relationship. So I'm not, I'm not what's in it for me. I'm not, how can you help me? Who can you connect me with? I'm here to simply say, who are you? What are you doing? Where are you at now? Are you stuck or need on anything that I can help with? And I may or may not be able to help, but that's my intent. And that's what I'm there to, to be, uh, to work with. And I think that that concept 
while it was incredibly impactful for me through all of my professional life, now more than ever, um, it is is proven to be the most, I would say the only way to really start to build strong relationships and build a strong network today is coming at it with that heart of, I'm not here for what's in it for me. I'm mm-hmm. here for the other person. And, and oftentimes you walk away without having gotten or even sharing really a lot of what it is that you're doing or what you need, and that's okay. That's not the point. What ends up happening is that that person begins to trust you. They begin to feel more comfortable and connected to you. They begin to um, really let their guard down and want to become more interest, uh, invested in the relationship itself. And there's nothing stronger than being able to have that with another individual. And whether they ever help you or not isn't the point. You just, all you ever do is work to contribute. Oh, doors just open up left and right when when that's that's your approach. And it's kind of a, I don't mean to get woo-woo or zen there, but you know, it works better now than it ever did. Yeah, yeah, great advice. Um, my last question, I'm a big fan of gratitude, especially expressing gratitude publicly to peers and contemporaries, those who've helped you along the way. You've mentioned names of a number here. Uh, but who would you call out? Who would you want to thank publicly for helping you along the way? So I, you know, obviously my wife and I, Becky, have worked together on multiple projects and and built the school and built our businesses together. And it's, it's awesome. And I give her praise constantly everywhere. So I'm going to, I'm going to, as I love her and absolutely the one person I would like to call out who I don't get a chance to very often is definitely my business partner from the legal marketing agency, Mark Homer. Um, incredible guy worth connecting with. If you're listening to this show, go look up Mark Homer um, from GNGF. Um, he, he, he taught me so much about the act of running a business over the 10 years that we worked together in our business. We we're a business partner for 10 years. And I would watch him just master operations in a way that I had no idea what I was doing. And it is so important that I was like, oh my gosh, I see now why this is matters. And it's like, it, it just, and, and he's such a kind soul and just really is a, a stand up human. And he was, you know, when we came to him and said, hey, we got to go do the school thing. I need you to buy me out. He didn't even hesitate. Mm. He's like, I get it. You know, like it's, this has been awesome, but I understand why go. And that's the kind of person that I call them Bangladesh friends. Those ones where you could be in Bangladesh, pick up the phone, call them and say, I need you to get here. <laughs> and they'd get on a plane and come and then say, okay, why am I here? Like uh, he, he's one of those, which is, which is always nice to have those in your life. Well, Javez, thank you so much for ch- sharing your story uh, today. Uh, where can people go to learn more about you and, and what you're focused on? Yeah, uh, socials are great. I'm on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on all those places. Obviously, lotuslaunch.com um, if you want to see our business stuff that we're up to. Um, but certainly on, on LinkedIn or Twitter is, is a great place to, to come connect. Or you can email me, jabez.labrette at gmail. Awesome, Jabez. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Smart Business Revolution podcast with John Corcoran. Find out more at smartbusinessrevolution.com. And while you're there, sign up for our email list and join the revolution. 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 And be listening for the next episode of the Smart Business Revolution podcast.